there is much said today about the immune system. It is acknowledged in just about every health circle that you would mix in, whether it be allopathic, medical, whether it be alternate or uh, herbal or dietary, but it is acknowledged that the best way to fight disease is to have a strong immune system. So what I'd like to do in this presentation is I want to show you what is your immune system? Because if you were to ask most people, what's your immune system? Many would hesitate. Many do not know what it is. What, what is your immune system? And so if strengthening your immune system is vital to keeping the body in good working order, is vital to being able to fight disease, then we need to know. And as the old proverb says, it's Proverbs 14 verse 6, knowledge is easy to him that understands. It is my aim to give you an understanding of your immune system, then you will automatically have the knowledge on how to strengthen it and you will also know how to weaken it, which is something we need to keep away from. So let's begin by looking at what our immune system is. So looking at the body, God created the body with a, a coat of armour over it and the suit of armour, so to speak, is your skin. So your skin is your front line of your immune system. And I think we all know that when you break that skin, you now have exposed the tissues, the blood, to the air. And we also discussed how there's microorganisms everywhere. And that skin is a barrier of protection. So as soon as that skin is broken and the blood is is exposed, the raw flesh is exposed, exposed, then I think we all know if that happens, it's important to wash it and get excess dirt off. It's also important to cover it so that you're helping the body by protecting it while it is in that exposed and vulnerable state. So the skin is a front line. The skin is a fascinating organism and it is an organism. If you were to stretch it out it would take up a huge area especially when you consider all the little folds between your fingers, between your toes and it has millions of little pores. Dr Kellogg called them millions of little sewers. Why did he do that? Because those pores are throwing off waste. Have you ever worn a white shirt? Especially on a hot day where you perspire a little more than usual the, the collar can be uh, quite brown at the end of the day, indicating the waste that's just come out of your body. And that's why it is so important to wash every day, wash the waste off. Our top layer of skin is dead skin, which is why exfoliation of the skin is also important. Your skin throws off waste. Your skin also absorbs things your skin also breathes. In our last presentation, we looked in detail at the skin. We're not going to look in detail at the skin today. I just want to show you that's your front line of defense. But notice that wherever you've got orifices in the body, you've got a whole lot of defense lines there. So let's start by looking at the ears. We have our eardrum, but not only the eardrum, we've also got all those little hairs that are in the ear canal, so that if anything happens to get in there, those hairs can help to push it out. You've also got earwax, which also helps to trap things, so you've got a, a bit of a frontline system there. The eye. Notice with the eye, we've got two bones here and here, so if anything were to hit, it's usually stopped by those two bones. And then you've got your eyelashes. If anything comes near the eye, we automatically blink and, and that blinking helps to keep most things out of the eye. But if let's say a little bug or something gets into the eye, when it gets into the eye, the eye is covered with this mucus, which is of course a liquid and it traps or drowns or smothers that little bug that might have got in through the eyelashes and into the eye. And 
it's trapped there. And I think we all know if we make our eye go around and around and around and around, it'll eventually work itself into the corner of the eye. And when it gets into the corner of eye, it usually can be just wiped out. The eye cells are remade every two to three days. And that is why when people are recovering from eye surgery, the recovery time is quite quick. But it also explains why if you get something in your eye, you need to deal with that pretty quickly. And our body wants us to because you almost can't think it is such a distraction having something that is in your eye. Sometimes it could be, I know we had one man who was working up at our retreat and he was, he was grinding and he was only grinding it for a very short while and he didn't feel that he needed to have protective eyeglass on and a little bit of metal got into his eye. How are you going to get that out? And we're, we were two hours from town when we were at our old property. Our property now, we're an hour from town, but our, our previous property, we were two hours from town. Well, some bright spark came up with the great idea, and we thank God for great ideas, to put a um, magnet near his eye, and it, it pulled a bit of metal out. But interesting to note that that eye has a protective system there as well. Then we go to the nose and the nose is also quite fascinating because inside the nose there are all these little caves so to speak. So when you breathe in air that has bits of dust on it, it is heavy. If you breathe in pure air it is light and it goes straight through to the trachea and down to the lungs. But if you're breathing in air that has it's dirty air, maybe it's got a lot of dust particles on it, then it's heavy. And when it's heavy, it drops down and it ricochets across to each little side of the nose. So those little caves are designed for it to ricochet around, let go of its piece of dust, which lightens it, and then it can breathe through into the trachea down into the lungs. Also, you've got your epiglottis. You might know your epiglottis and your epiglottis closes every time you swallow so that when you swallow, it closes off the trachea so that what you're drinking or eating will go down the esophagus and into the stomach, not through the trachea. So if it goes down to the trachea, this air, and there happens to be a little bit of dust that slipped through, then the, the mucus that is lining the lungs, those little hairs that are lining the lungs are ever moving it up and up. And if you do get a little bit down there, you'll find your cough. And what the coughing reflex is to basically dislodge anything that might have got into the lungs. So there's an incredible process in there that can be considered our immune system because it is protecting the body against harmful pathogens. And then we go into the mouth. In the mouth, there's a huge amount of microorganisms. And as I mentioned earlier, dental health is, is of the utmost importance to protect our teeth because if we don't floss or rinse our teeth after a meal and little bits of food get caught there, those microorganisms start to, to uh, change roles to become the cleanup team in the mouth and become bacteria. And as that bacteria works on those little bits of food, the waste they give off can start to decay or break down the enamel. So dental hygiene is, is very important. But all those microorganisms in the mouth, they play a very important role. They also are contributing to the breakdown of our food. There's a lot of uh, mucus in our mouth. In fact, mucus lines the mouth, it lines the, it's the eyes and also the nose. And they're all connected by something called the eustachian tubes. And the eustachian tubes are linking all of those areas there. And often when one eustachian tube is blocked, then you get uh, effects in the other eustachian tubes. For instance, people that suffer from sinus problems often also suffer from tinnitus. It's contributing because of the blockage in those areas. So now we're getting down into the, into the stomach and there's a valve from the esophagus and into the stomach. 
So I'm going to draw the stomach and show you how our immune system is even playing a role here. Lining the stomach are big folds. We had a look at this when we looked at the gut. And again, you've got a line of protection there. And that line of protection is mucus. So there are gastric glands that line these folds. And two thirds of these gastric glands are made up of mucus. So those glands there, probably about that amount of them, are releasing mucus. And that causes a thick mucosa wall to line the stomach, protecting it from damage against hydrochloric acid. One drop of hydrochloric acid, if it were to go in your skin, it would burn a hole in your skin. So God designed the stomach with this thick mucosa wall. But down here, there are glands that release hydrochloric acid and it's hydrochloric acid that I want to talk about. Pepsinogen is also released from here and when it connects with hydrochloric acid it releases pepsin and that breaks down your protein. But we are studying the immune system so the one I want to target is hydrochloric acid. Most people don't realize that not only does hydrochloric acid play an important role in breaking down or denaturing the protein, but it is also antibacterial, it's antifungal, it's antimicrobial. So if we happen to eat anything that has some bacteria in it or some yeast or fungus on it, that hydrochloric acid has the ability to, to kill it, basically to wipe it out. So you look at dogs. Dogs have about 10 times the hydrochloric acid in their stomachs compared to humans. And I don't know if you've seen what some dogs eat. My daughter lives out in the country and, and across the road they killed a cow. Well, her dog was pulling the dead meat and bones in and oh, it was a very bad smell and the dog eats it. And the dog doesn't die because the dog has about 10 times the hydrochloric acid that we have. So our frontline defense when we get into the body is our hydrochloric acid. Unfortunately today many people have low hydrochloric acid. How do you know if you've got low hydrochloric acid? If you've got low hydrochloric acid then digestion is very slow. It's five hours after the meal and you feel like you've only just eaten the meal. And because the food's not getting broken down as quickly as it should it can start to ferment and there's bloating. So bloating is often a sign and uh, still not hungry five hours after the meal. That is another sign that the person has low hydrochloric acid. Well, how do you boost hydrochloric acid? To boost hydrochloric acid, we need to give breaks between the meals. And to be able to give a break between the meal, we need to be eating, and we've also looked at this, high fiber. High fibre slowly releases the glucose so the food stays in the stomach a little longer. We need to be eating generous amounts of protein because it's in the stomach that protein is broken down. We also need to be having healthy fats. Fats is found in your avocados, your coconuts, your nuts, your seeds and maybe with the meal a little olive oil or coconut depending on what your taste is. When these three foods are present in the meal, they cause the food to stay in the stomach longer, which means you can now do the time-restricted eating, which the research is showing is the most effective way to eat today, which is breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen. Isn't this history? Isn't this your old saying? And then supper like a pauper. One lady said, what do paupers eat? I said, sometimes nothing. <laughs> when you are eating like that, check that one out, time-restricted eating. A lot of research today is showing that it is the most effective way to eat. And when you do the time-restricted eating, you are eating twice in a six-hour period. So you're eating a good-sized breakfast, high in fibre, proteins and fats, a good-sized lunch, 
high in fiber, generous proteins, healthy fats, and then you don't eat again till breakfast the next day. And if someone is a little hungry at night, maybe they didn't get enough lunch, they could have a protein drink, they could have maybe a smoothie, they could have an avocado, that's a nice evening meal that digests very quickly, or maybe a bowl of soup, just something light, if they have anything. So when you eat like this, you're giving your stomach a break. And when you give that stomach a break, it has the opportunity to replace all the digestive enzymes, the hydrochloric acid, so that your next meal, your glands have got a, uh, they're well supplied, well supplied with the enzymes required to, to break down your meal. So to boost hydrochloric acid, have a break between meals. To boost hydrochloric acid, drink between meals. Don't drink it with meals. Because if you drink with meals, this hydrochloric acid that has a pH of approximately two, very acid, if you drink with your meals, you will dilute your hydrochloric acid. And that delays digestion. And if you dilute the hydrochloric acid and digestion is delayed, why is it delayed? It slows down to try and get rid of the water. The body tries to get rid of the water to bring the pH back up to two so it can once again resume the breakdown of the protein. So what depletes hydrochloric acid is eating all day long, drinking with the meals, stressed with the meal, also not chewing enough. If you don't chew enough, it's very difficult for your enzymes to break down big lumps compared to tiny little well broken up lumps. So one of the first ways to boost, let's have a look, let's make a list of all the things you can do to boost your immune system. To boost your immune system, make sure that you have adequate hydrochloric acid. What if you're doing all of those things and it's still a little low? You can take the juice of a lemon just before the meal. You can have a quarter of a cup of very hot water just before the meal. You could have a quarter of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper in a little hot water just before the meal. All of those things will give a boost to hydrochloric acid. And you can be taking that until the time comes when your body once again is in the habit of making generous amounts of hydrochloric acid. Your liver makes the hydrochloric acid. And yesterday, your liver needed two cups of water to make enough hydrochloric acid for breakfast. Yesterday, your liver needed another two cups of water to make enough hydrochloric acid for lunch. So adequate water. Our immune system needs water and it needs eight to ten glasses every day. And the best way to take that water is the way the God sends the rain, little by little by little, way over the day. When we perspire, it's salty. When we cry, it's salty. Our blood is salty. And so we also need the salt. So the whole salt. The whole salt, and ideally this is Celtic salt, if you can't get Celtic, use Himalayan. Celtic salt has 82 minerals, whereas Himalayan salt has 75, so it's fairly close. So a little bit of salt before each glass of water, and what this does, this is supplying the minerals, and the minerals are vital for the proper functioning of the whole of the body, and the immune system is no exception there. Going further down the gastrointestinal tract, we're going to go further down now and we're going to have a look at the next front line of our immune system and it's the villi that line. So these villi are a little different, they're a lot smaller, they're not like the big folds that are lining the stomach. They're villi and up the middle of the villi is a lacteal, that's part of the lymphatic system. Your lymphatic system sweeps away waste from the tissues. So an important part of, of ensuring that you have a, a proper functioning, effective immune system is to vacuum your body every day because the more waste that's in your body, the more 
bacteria is going to have to develop to clean it up. Over these little villi is your blood capillary network. So where is the next line of defence? The next line of defence is your gut flora. So your gut flora basically forms a thick turf wall and it covers those villi. Now this, this thick turf wall, the two permanent bacterias are Lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacterium. They are the two permanent bacteria that live in your gastrointestinal tract. All the others are made from those two permanent ones. And what does this gut flora do? It breaks down. It's, it's responsible for the final breakdown, putting the finishing touches on our digestion. This gut flora is also responsible for the absorption of our nutrients through and into the blood. This gut flora, and now we come to the immune part role, and now we're coming to the second front line of defense, and it plays a protective role. And this protective role is designed to put a C in there. This protective role is to protect the blood and the lymph from any harmful pathogens that might be in the gut. Now ideally they've all been wiped out by hydrochloric acid up in the stomach. But if hydrochloric acid is low because the person's eating all day and they're drinking too much with their meals and they're stressed out all the time, it, there are some that are going to get through because there wasn't enough hydrochloric acid to wipe them out. But God is very good because he gave us the next line of defense, which is our gut flora. This gut flora also plays a role in nourishment, nourishing the cells, nourishing the cells that line the gastrointestinal tract. But I want to target this protective role. You see, the body's doing all it can to protect the blood. We saw what the ears do to protect the blood. We saw what the eyes do to protect the blood. We saw what the nose does. And now we've gone down the gastrointestinal tract to see how there are different processes in place to protect our blood from many harmful pathogens that might come in on our food. Again, if hydrochloric acid's low and some of those harmful pathogens are getting through to the gut, We've got another line of defense, and this is the gut flora. The Lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacterium. So what we need to look at is what would break that down. Because if that's working well, we have nothing to fear. So what breaks down that gut flora? What breaks down the gut flora is a few things, refined sugar, Refined sugar is toxic, it's highly acid, and it has the ability not only to break down that gut flora, but that gut flora runs according to precision balance, a fine balance of the yeast and bacteria in the gut. And when the bacteria is wiped out, the yeast can get out of control, and the refined sugar feeds that yeast, so it starts to uh, repopulate at an astonishing rate. What also breaks it down is antibiotics. I acknowledge, and I'd be a fool not to, that antibiotics have saved life. Of course they've saved lives. But we've got a problem today, and the World Health Organization is so concerned about this that they have a, they have a sign in every doctor's surgery. And that sign says the biggest health crisis they believe today is the overuse of antibiotics. The human body can cope with one or two courses in a lifetime, but the things that you're learning in this series hopefully means that you can get by most things without ever having to go to an antibiotic. I'm so glad that the coronavirus is a virus. <laughs> Otherwise, 
people would be being bombarded with those antibiotics. And I do hope that if you have the coronavirus, you are not given an antibiotic because it, it, it will not help. One writer said taking an antibiotic is like dropping an atomic bomb in the gastrointestinal tract. What did the atomic bomb do? It wiped out the good and bad. And that's what antibiotics will do. Yes, it'll, it'll wipe out the, the pathogenic bacteria, but it will also wipe out the good bacteria. And once you start wiping out this good bacteria, you've lost not only your you know, your final breakdown and absorption, but your protection. And that's what we're looking at specifically in this lecture is, is the protection. Many drugs. So your pain-killing drugs. Now, this is not so much the odd one that someone may take, but it's the long-term use of painkillers can have quite a devastating effect. Statin drugs. They are also known to help wipe out the uh, lining of the gastrointestinal tract. So can you see what's happening here, especially if someone's eating all day long and drinking with their meals and stressed all the time, especially at mealtime? Hydrochloric acid is not able to play the role that God meant it to, which is antifungal, antimicrobial. And if someone's on these, or even one of them, and this is their gut flora is getting broken down. Can you see now we've lost our second line of defense? So what can often happen now is pathogenic bacteria can get into the blood. Do you remember I said that they're all designed to protect the blood. So what happens when it gets into the blood? Well, God is so good, we've got another defense system in there. And that defense system is our white blood cells. So our white blood cells are a powerful group that are designed to kill off any unwanted pathogens that may get into the blood, yeast fungus. And what those, what those white blood cells do, there are five different types. So let me show you what the five different types do. You've got neutrophils, and neutrophils, they are probably the biggest killers. So they take up about 60% of our white blood cell. The next one are your monocytes, and your monocytes take up approximately 20% of the white blood cells. After that, we've got leukocytes. And leukocytes are made in your lymphatic system. Sorry, they're not leukocytes, they're lymphocytes. Leukocytes is a name given to all the white blood cells. They can be called white blood cells or leukocytes. Now, this is lymphocytes. And your lymphocytes are made in your lymph nodes. And they take up 15% of the white blood cells. And then you've got basophils. Basophils only make up about 3%. And your eosinophils. Eosinophils take up about 2% of your white blood cells. So there's your five white blood cells. Your lymphocytes are the scouts. So the lymphocytes they come around looking for any problems. And when they see a problem, they usually contact the neutrophils, maybe a little bit the monocytes. And the neutrophils contain hydrogen peroxide in them. And that's what they usually do. They usually kill it off with that little dose of, hydra, of uh, hydrogen peroxide in the middle. So I think when people talk about our immune system, I think mostly they're referring to these white blood cells. So your white blood cells is an amazing internal army. Now have a look at this. With our blood, our blood contains red blood cells and the red blood cells carry the oxygen, the red blood cells carry the nutrients, the red blood cells also carry the water and they carry away waste. So they dispose of 
or take away waste. But your, your blood also contains not only red blood cells, but white blood cells. And our white blood cells are, are our internal army. So when we have any sort of problem in the human body, if we can get more blood to that area, can you see that that will help to heal the area? Because when we get more blood, we get more oxygen, more nutrients, more water, the body is able to take away more waste and our white blood cells, our internal army are coming. Now when they start killing off unwanted bacteria, pathogens, they die. So if someone's got, let's say someone has a bad chest cold and they've been smoking for 20 years, so there's going to be a fair bit of damage in their lungs. So what happens is our body's own microorganisms, they start to change roles, so to speak, and become bacteria to clean up the waste. And the, the white blood cells come there consuming that, and then the person coughs up yellow lumps. You know what the yellow lumps in? They're just dead white blood cells. They're, they're doing a wonderful job of helping to clean up the area. That's what they are and that's what they do. And the formation of these white blood cells is much dependent on the gut bacteria. You see it all comes together. No wonder Hippocrates said all disease begins in the gut. So there's your white blood cells. But let me tell you something a little bit about the eosinophils. The eosinophils you will find present when there's allergies. So the eosinophils, they carry the histamine. And the histamine is also a protein that's released by the body to help manage drought management. So if a person's dehydrated, they'll also find more eosinophils. But if the person's eating a food that they have an allergy to, there will be also more eosinophils. And when eosinophils are high, histamine levels are high, then the person gets allergy type response. There's your hay fevers, there's your allergies to the dust mite, allergy to cat, allergy to pollen, I've, I've noticed that when a person has these allergies, if they change their diet and eliminate the most common allergen foods, then they don't have the allergy to dust mite anymore. They don't have the allergy to pollen anymore. They don't have the allergy to cat anymore. So that's the good news. So what are the foods? So we'll make a list of the allergen foods here. So if someone has an allergen, or an allergic reaction, it's usually because the eosinophils have been activated to deal with it and with their high histamine levels, there's the allergy type responses. Peanuts, they're a common allergen food to the point where I think, I'm pretty sure in Australia, peanuts are banned from schools. Also dairy, there is a small percentage of people that can handle dairy and it's usually because it's in their heritage, maybe dairy farmers for the last several hundred years. It's certainly not, not in my heritage. I find dairy, I've always found dairy very difficult to handle and I think it's because it's not in my heritage. Hybridized wheat. Now what's caused the allergies to the hybridized wheat was the, was the hybridization of the wheat. So the wheat was put through intensive crossbreeding in the 50s, went worldwide in the 70s, so by the 1990s, every wheat product you buy is made out of the hybridized wheat. What are the symptoms of an intolerance to the wheat? Uh, celiac's probably the most severe, but you can have a wheat intolerance. You can have a wheat sensitivity, so you've sort of got different stages. If someone is sensitive to wheat and they keep eating it, they can certainly develop the intolerance. And then if they keep eating, they can certainly develop into, into something that's more severe. The gluten intolerance is often called celiac. 
but many people don't realise they have an intolerance because many people just live with the bloating and the brain fog or eczema or psoriasis or diarrhoea or irritable bowel, not realising the link between these foods and the conditions that they have. Now some people it is oats too, some people can handle oats. My suggestion is stop the oats and when all the symptoms subside that can be the first food that you, you introduce. A lot of people have found having millet for breakfast is a nice alternative to having oats. It takes a little longer but that you can cook it in your crock pot overnight. So they're the most common allergen foods. So when those foods are eaten by people that do have an allergy, eosinophil levels rise. And when eosinophil levels rise, histamine levels rise and there's your, your allergy type symptoms. So how do we get these eosinophils right down to where they should be? Well, the first step is stopping the known allergens. That's step number one. Start to build up the gut flora by taking your probiotic foods. So, so let's have a look at probiotic foods. So your probiotic foods are your cultured foods. So that's miso, sauerkraut, and kefir yogurt. So you might do kefir or you might do yogurt and you can do those very nicely with uh, the nut milks or your soy milks or coconut or almond milk. So these foods, when they're included in part of the diet, they help to restore that, that gut flora that is so easily broken down by these things. So you see, there are some things that need to be stopped. Let's continue our list of what to do to boost the immune system. Boosting the immune system, there are some things that should stop and stop the allergens, the allergen foods. I find with some people they also need to stop the nightshades. You see the nightshade group of vegetables, that's tomato, eggplant, bell pepper and potato, and also your wheat and your oats. These are also high in lectins, and if you have a gut sensitivity like this, the lectins can also contribute to the problem. So stop the allergen foods and increase cultured foods. Oh, there's another one up there that I didn't put, and that is your, your sourdough breads. But your sourdough breads ideally are made out of the ancient grains, not the hybridised wheat. So increase probiotic foods. So with the hydrochloric acid, as I said, increase. And can you see that? You're stopping, the, you're stopping the irritants. I'll also add here, and most people that are watching this don't do this, but for some who might still be doing it, the caffeine. Caffeine is also quite a dis disastrous food for the gut and alcohol. If you are on any statin drugs, you can watch the presentation on heart health and see how you can get off them. If you are on antibiotics, you can watch the poultice lecture and it will show you how you can take a flu bomb instead of the antibiotic. If you want something sweet, you can go to your natural sweeteners like the honey and the palm sugar and also the maple syrup. And if you are on painkillers, we will be doing a presentation shortly too on how to, how to conquer pain in your body. But most pain is due to inflammation, so it's targeting that inflammation. So what else can you do to boost your immune system? A plant-based diet. You see, what a plant-based diet contains, especially your vegetables, is what's spoken out 
about quite a bit today and that's your prebiotics. Especially your vegetable fibre is what's called prebiotics. So basically prebiotics is vegetable fibre and what prebiotics does is it feeds the probiotics which of course is your, your healthy gut flora. So that also plays a very important role. One of the best blood immune system boosters is your alternating hot and colds. So what do I mean by alternating hot and colds? A lot of people fear a fever. But when you think about it, God designed the fever to play a role in fighting disease. And for centuries all through Europe, health centres have used fevers to heal illnesses. Because when the temperature rises, then the production of your white blood cells that are made in your blood in your bone marrow with your, with your red blood cells. The lymphocytes are the only ones that are made in the lymphatic system. But when the temperature rises, your immune system production also automatically increases. Temperature rises for a reason. Temperature rises to kill pathogens in the body. So never fear a temperature. When I was a nurse, if someone had a temperature, we immediately cooled them down and gave them um, Panadol, I think we, we do to get that temperature down. But I do not do that now because since studying the human body and realizing that the temperature is there or the temperature has risen, which is called a fever, for a reason. And the only time the brain might convulse is if it gets dehydrated. So it's of the utmost importance that someone with a fever sip, 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 be sipping the water, even suck on ice, just sip, 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 that water must go in. But also, if they cannot take any water, maybe they're vomiting, they can get, you can get water into the body via an enema. If you give an enema, you can get two cups of water in like that. It's actually quicker than a drip. I think every home should have an enema kit. In fact, all through Europe, it was traditional that every home had an enema kit because when someone was sick, they found that it, they always began to heal a lot quicker if their bowels were emptied. But if they had a fever, they'd put water in that way. And, and because increasing the hydration of the body helps to cool the body, Three things to remember with a fever. Fever is your friend. It's there for a reason. And when all the rubbish is burnt up, the fire will go out. So one of its purpose is to burn the rubbish. Or I think in the US you call it trash, is that, or waste. And number three, water puts the fire out. So water puts the fire out. So what do I mean by that? You can use water to reduce that fever. The most powerful way is drinking it. So as much as you can, just sip, 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 sip the water. But you can also use water externally. This fever is boosting the immune system. At our retreats, we have steam saunas and we give people fevers every afternoon. They go into the steam sauna and the steam gets them very, very hot. Then they have a cold shower or cold dunk. In, over at Misty, it'll be dunking in the creek. And then back into the steam bath. Usually by the third steam bath, their temperature can be up to 40, which I think might be at Celsius, uh, Fahrenheit, it might be, I think, a little bit over 100. And you'll always end with cold. Now that alternating hot and cold, alternating the fever and the cold dunk, alternating these hot and colds, 
it does a massive boost to the bone marrow to make more white blood cells, more red blood cells. So it's an excellent tool and it's been acknowledged for thousands of years, fever bath treatments or steam sauna treatments to actually create that fever, to help fight disease. So one way you can do it at home, you might not have a steam sauna, not many people do. What you can do is after every hot shower, have a cold rinse. Now start with 10 seconds. And this isn't one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is one and two and three and four. <laughs> ten seconds can be a long time when you've got coal going on you. And then little by little every day, go up a couple of seconds, go up a couple of seconds more. So at the moment in the US, it's summer. So this is a good time to get used to your cold dunk after your hot shower, ready for the winter months because it's one of the best protections against colds and flus. It's one of the best immune system boosters there is, is those hot and colds. And the best time to do those alternating hot and colds is after your exercise. And the exercise that is particularly powerful in boosting your immune system is the high intensity interval training. The high intensity interval training are intervals of high intensity and intervals of recovery. So when you're cycling as hard and fast as you can, or you're running up that hill and you start to perspire, and then you have your recovery time where you allow your body to cool down and rest down a little bit, and then you run again or cycle again or rebound again, whatever it is that you find you can do for your high intensity interval training. With the high intensity, it's intervals of high intensity of 30 seconds. Then recovery is usually 90 seconds. And then that's usually done for a cycle of six. So let's do the maths on that. That's only 12 minutes a day. Only 12 minutes a day. That's nothing. If you don't think you've got 12 minutes, it's time to assess what you do with your day. Because I believe we can't afford not to do that every day. So boosting the immune system is taking in, men, in many aspects. And I think when you look at this, you'll start to see we've really gone through those true remedies once again which is pure air. To boost your immune system, you must breathe in fresh air. No bad air, please. To boost your immune system, daily sunshine. When the sunshine touches the skin, it stimulates blood to that area. And when you stimulate blood, you've got more red blood cells, more white blood cell, boost your immune system. Temperance, not taking anything to the body that will harm it. So here are the foods that you stop. The known allergen foods, the caffeines, the alcohols, the refined sugars. They must stop. Rest, go to bed early. You want to boost your immune system. Early nights. And this is not only early nights, but eight hours. Eight hours, not negotiable. It's only in the eight hours that your immune system gets its full boost, which it happens while we sleep. Eight hours a night. Exercise, we've looked at. Your proper diet, the plant-based diet. Use of water, keep well hydrated. Where's our water? Up here. And the final law, trust in divine power, last and certainly far from least, thank God every day for your immune system. Thank God every day for the knowledge on how to boost it. Thank God every day that you live in a body that has been designed to heal itself. And if you give it the right conditions, it will heal itself. So what do you do if you get sick, if you get a cold, if you get COVID, if you get a flu? Implement all of this and you can take some herbs. What are the herbs? 
the herbs to help fight a cold, the herbs to help fight a flu, and I think we know them and we know them very well, the lemon, the humble lemon, honey, and you can add some garlic to that, all your warming herbs. You can add some ginger to that. You can add some cayenne pepper to that. You can add some horseradish to that. You can blend all this in a blender. Eucalyptus oil, remember there definitely is a measurement for this one. And this is one drop. Horseradish, that's great for the sinuses. You blend all this up every day and have a quarter of a cup of that even every day. In fact, Dr. Richard Schultz, he said, no self-respecting germ will ever survive <laughs> in that little mix there. So once again, we thank God for a body that can heal itself. We thank God for an immune system that he put in there to help fight disease. Because God said in 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. Mm -hmm.